the highlight of the Tasmanian wool industry's calendar is the Campbelltown Show. As well as being the state's premier sheep show, it's the longest continuing country show in Australia. This year there was an air of excitement that hasn't been felt on the showgrounds for many years, as the show celebrated its 175th birthday. But the excitement was down to another reason too, as the region, which has been hit hard by the decline of the wool industry, is now on the cusp of momentous change and hopefully prosperity due to a multi-million dollar irrigation scheme that will soon be adding water to sheep country. When the wool industry crashed 22 years ago, farmers in Tasmania's wool heartland of the Midlands thought the bad times might last a few years and the good prices would return. But that never happened, forcing many to diversify into cropping and prime lambs. Wool sheep numbers plummeted as growers scaled back or got out of the industry altogether. Richard Johnson is the new face of Midlands agriculture. He's fourth generation and the family property at Longford used to be all about wool. Now it's prime lambs, cropping and wool. Things happen, yeah, you can't do much about it. Yeah, you just got to go where the, where the money is. At the end of the day, if it's not paying the bills, well, you've got to find something that is. To that end, seven years ago, he bought Dooney rams into the mix. The Dooney is a South African meat merino uh, brought into Australia. So they've got carcass attributes and also wool attributes. So um, we're, we're looking for um, nice, white, bright wool um, with a traditional finer crimp there and there and nice, good soft handle. The Doonies give the Johnsons some insurance. They still get 18 micron wool, but crossbred prime lambs as well. The females are better mothers than straight merinos, so they're, they're a bit more fertile and also they don't run off when they have a lamb, so, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. And, and, and then the ease of lamb too, they, they come out a really light birth weight and really long and leggy like a giraffe. So, and then they hit the straps. And is there a lot to learn when you are moving from wool into prime lamb production and, and trying to get those prime lambs really good? Yes, yeah. I, um, our first lot of rams that we picked for terminal size, the dorsets were terrible that we picked. Because um, we're mainly a, a wool focus have been in the past. So, yeah, I, I generally get our agent to, to give us a hand and gives us a few pointers on, on what, what's the better ram. I sort of know a bit about these, the, the wool type sheep, but the, the terminal size, I'm <laughs> still a bit scratchy. Yeah. Three years ago, the Campbelltown Show Society added a paddock to plate prime lamb competition to the schedule. And last year, on his first try, Richard won it. It's not so much winning, it's, it's more putting your lambs in, and, and we've got neighbours around us that, that with different uh, breeds that put it in as well, so you can stack up, see how your breed goes with other, other breeds. He entered his Dooney Merino Dorset Cross Lambs again this year. Do you think you're a chance to have a back-to-back -back win? Mm, you don't know. Don't know till the day. <laughs> we'll see. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. It's a two-stage competition, on the hook as a carcass and on the hoof, live in front of a judge at the show. At the abattoir, the 20 entries were judged by butcher Philip Robinson. The lambs are coming in better pre presented as such because the farmers are improving in their, their weight range and the lambs are more accurate. Well, I thought the lambs were better than last year. I think they're nice and soft and well shaped and I think the farms are doing, have done a good job. Abattoir owner Brian Oliver says the competition is already lifting quality. It continues to make the farmers aware of what the needs are on a processing point of view and uh, to get better yields and therefore a better return for their lambs. After the judging, growers were able to check out the competition. 
Richards had a perfect score. Do you think your father's generation would ever have imagined there'd be lamb competitions and cropping competitions at the Campbelltown show? Uh, probably not so, but um, I think things change all the time, so you can't just stay on the same course all the way through and think that it's going to happen. Last year, the show committee added another new event for croppers. First time entrant Cressy farmer William Morrison nominated a wheat crop. This was a wool property, but not anymore. We went through a few years where we kept trying to grow merino wool and we didn't make any money, so we've basically all cropped now, or 70% crop, right? yeah. So when you were growing up, did you, you and your vintage think your lives would be in wool and it's all turned out very differently? Yeah, I thought I was going to be foot-pairing sheep for the rest of my life and uh, crutching dags off, but yeah, no, it definitely changed. Nowhere near what I thought it was going to be. We entered the crop competition to sort of benchmark ourselves against other growers and probably mainly to work out our cost of production and overall a gross margin to see if we're in the ballpark or doing the right thing. Uh, I'm not sure where we'll stand, but yeah, I'd like to be up there with the winners. The first morning of the two-day show looked good for a 175th birthday party. It's a remarkable unbroken feat no other show in the country has managed. Neither two world wars, a depression or the collapse of wool prices in the 60s and early 90s could derail it. It's a terrific effort from all the committees over, you know, 175 years that we're still, you know, still going as strong as ever now. I mean, we had a point probably, um, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, things were struggling a little bit. We had to make some changes. It's a focal social fun occasion, really, I suppose. Everyone gets to see people they may not have seen from the year before, and it's a, it's a good, fun, happy event. Uh, lots of things to do and see. I reckon it's absolutely vital. I reckon it's just one of those little threads that holds the whole community together. Former committee president Andrew Nicholson's an elder statesman of the show. He still brings his beloved Corridales and has probably been to more shows than anyone on the grounds. I'd call, call it 70, I think it'd be bad. It's safe to say, I, whether I came here as a baby now, I'm not sure. I had three years of Geelong College when there was no way I was going to get here. Otherwise, I don't think I'd miss one. He remembers this shed buzzing when wool was king, but says the young committee has done well to keep the show relevant, with nods to its wool-rich past, as well as celebrating the agriculture of today. Having spray rigs on display is something he could not have imagined 30 years ago. I had 50 years on the committee, so now I'm out of that, but I'm glad to see it's still in very, very good hands. This one might make it number 15, do you reckon? One of those young committee members is wool grower Georgina Wallace. The daughter of Jim McEwen, one of the country's most respected superfine wool men, she's now in charge of the Trefusis show team. Yeah. Trefusis Merinos have shown here for decades, taking home blue and the broad championship ribbons in countless classes, including the prestigious Xenia Superfine Fleece competition 14 times. Georgina's been coming here since she was a child, and while many of her generation have got out of wool, she's not been able to quit it. I just have a passion for it. It's you know you just uh, still get that buzz when you open up a sheep and you just think wow that's just beautiful. Um, um, still love you know seeing that wool in in the shearing shed. But a decreasing number of growers think like her. For this year, just 65 merinos were entered. She remembers in the 80s a full shed with up to 30 merinos per class, hundreds and hundreds of sheep. Wool seemed unassailable back then, when the Italians and Japanese would go head to head at the Launceston wool sales, bidding over a million dollars for a single bale. Now it's a very different business, even for a superfine powerhouse like Trefusis. 
our farm. For instance, um, 20 years ago, 75% of our income would have come from wool, 25% from prime lamb operation. Probably now it's the other way around. So it's just indicative of um, you know where a lot of us have had to move um, to sort of um, you know get ahead. She says while sheep numbers were low, quality hasn't suffered. Oh, excellent. Very good quality, very good lineup of merino sheep. Um, I didn't think that all the mainland studs that would be coming were going to bring a load of rubbish, put it that way. So I knew that they'd bring some pretty handy sheep down here, and, and they have, so, uh, which is great to see. It's good. It keeps us honest and, um, yeah, keeps us working, you know, got to strive a bit harder. She was thankful there was a strong mainland presence this year. We're probably down to only about 40 merino studs left in Tasmania now and registered studs. And, um, you know, there's only a very small portion of that who people who actually show sheep traditionally anymore. So we really welcome all the mainland entries because it helps boost our numbers here. Hamish and Jock McLaren drove from Armidale in New South Wales. While showing isn't for everyone, they say it's good business. It's another form of benchmarking. It's just very easy to have a, have a good sheep at home, but it's not until you get it out on the mat against everyone else and, and, and to see whether, whether it's as good as you think it is at home. Uh, even though there's not, not a lot of sheep here, there's some, the ones that are here are very good and, uh, and it's always good to get a blue one. <laughs> the McLarens took home a swag of ribbons, but one key prize, the New England Award, stayed in Tasmania vindicating grower Jack Cotton's decision to stick with wool. It's recognition for what I do because uh, we're becoming a little bit of a dying race to super fine wool growers so you have to have a lot of passion to keep at it because the returns unfortunately aren't really there but uh, so from that point of view it's great to receive recognition from our main wool buyers to, that we're doing the right thing. Based on the east coast the cottons grow wine grapes too. Luckily we've gone into the viticulture industry at the same time which our area also does very well if not the best so I've got two strings to the bow so I don't totally have to rely on the wool income. Very few wool growers have diversified into horticulture but that could change when the taps are turned on the $220 million Midlands water scheme next year. Water will be transformative for this region and the opportunities for moving into different products, different crops and um, for diversification and, and spreading your risk is a really fantastic opportunity for farmers here. This is sort of a bit of a chicken and egg thing at the moment and everyone sort of, or, or to me, we're all sitting there thinking, oh, what's the first, where's that first break? What's, what's, what's the winners going to be, you know? In a first for the show, a forum on the future of agriculture was held. The state's smartest operators and mainland water experts talked about how farmers could capitalise on the 38,000 megalitres of water. I love growing poppies. Uh, I get the same buzz out of that smell of flowering poppies that I used to get out of the smell of shorn sheep. Uh, it's the smell of money, obviously. <laughs> Wool grower and cropper Richard Gardner was a key driver behind the irrigation scheme. He'll use his water entitlement to reduce his reliance on poppies and go into dairying, a decision that's the talk of the district. I'm probably not the most knowledgeable person yet because I'm you know, just going through the throes of design and planning myself. But there's no doubt there's some interest about. There's a lot of people looking over the fence, let's put it that way, yeah. Cheesemaker Jane Bennett says dairying in the Midlands will be as much a cultural as a land use change. I think there's a lot of irony in looking at dairying in the Midlands. You know, it's a region where people, and, and once upon a time, this is an area where wool people looked down on dairy farmers um, when I was a child, and certainly in my youth, being a dairy farmer wasn't a thing to be proud of. And I think dairying is now the, um, the clear opportunity for Tasmania for the future. Around these parts, Melbourne investment banker David Williams is an enigma. Last year, when the irrigation scheme looked shaky as not enough farmers committed to buy water, he bought $10 million worth. I bought about 10,000 megs of water and I bought it because I believe this food price, food scarcity argument, you know, worldwide population increases, significant increases in wealth in places like China, 
those people need feed to be fed. They need increasing quality of feed. They don't want to just be eating, going from 2,500 calories to 3,500 calories and eating more rice. They want what we want. They want good beef, they want good dairy, etc. And Tasmania can provide that? It already is providing it. They've just got to do it on a bigger scale. Mr Williams has water but no land. So everyone wants to know what's his plan. I've got my own ideas, but when people ask me, I say, I don't have a plan, and they somehow think I'm just a cunning bugger uh, with something up my sleeve, but I'm, I've got lots of options so far. He urged farmers not to be tentative about the new era of irrigation. Clearly, a lot of farmers didn't take water, so they didn't understand. They don't understand the value of the water. The water here is cheap, you know, at $1,100 a meg, compared with what people are paying in the Murray-Darling and, you know, 13, 1400 government buying back water at $1,800 a meg. This is cheap water on fantastic land. And in a warning to local farmers, David Williams said if they didn't take advantage of the water, foreign interests would. And now with a vision and a management team, you can get the funds anywhere you want offshore. It's easier to get it offshore in the, in the Middle East or Southeast Asia or, or Latin America than it is out of Australia. But there's plenty of capital. You've just got to have a vision. You've got to get out of just thinking about uh, sheep and wool. The forum had farmers buzzing. But when it was over, it was time to go for a walk and do show things, like watching a few sheep classes, checking out the fashion and finding out which farmer had cooked the best man cake. Tasmania's celebrity reality TV stars Mick and Matt Newell were asked to judge. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see what the men can do and some of them are really impressive too. I think their wives have taught them, uh, taught them some good tricks. <laughs> they were pretty good. Genuinely nice yeah. cakes, the lot. Yep, the country men can certainly cook. <laughs> They can also grow grain and raise lambs. William Morrison won the cropping award and Richard Johnson's prime lambs did him proud again. Over the moon, yeah, no, we were wrapped. Yeah, especially with the, uh, over the hooks, scoring such a high, high score. And, and so it's good to get that feedback back um, on the, over the hooks. And, and today we're judging in the, in the pen that, that um, yeah, that, that we're heading in the right direction. This is what the market wants. So we'll, we've, we've made the right decision five or six years ago. Several months ago, just in time for the show, a statue honouring Eliza Furlong, the woman responsible for bringing the Saxon Merino to Tasmania, was unveiled in Campbelltown. It's a reminder that once the world wanted and would pay for fine Tasmanian wool. The days of wool prosperity might be gone, but David Williams says now the world wants Tasmania's food, and by adding water to wool country, Tasmania could become Australia's southern food bowl. But no matter what future water brings, even those who got out of wool say there's no Campbelltown show unless the aristocrats of the sheep world, the fine wool merino, is in attendance. <laughs>